All right, so look, everybody knows that we interview all types of people here at Hollywood Online, but one of them, a gospel legend, Yolanda Adams pulled up, and I was able to talk to her, and I feel a lot closer to God. Damage Blue, look, I, I know that I'm, I'm labeled a heathen, and I do heathen things, <laughs> but Yolanda Adams is such an icon. Do you, do you listen to gospel music? I don't even, I know you, you're a music man. But <laughs> oh. I actually do listen to gospel music. I'm Buddhist, but it's healing. <laughs> yeah. It's universally healing. You don't have to be someone who's a devout Christian to listen to gospel music to understand the message of God being universal. Yeah. And her voice, she's anointed. Yeah. Yeah, that came from God. No, I agree, because I grew up Muslim, and, and people used to be mad at me because I like would sing some, like, you know, some church songs. Some I'm Marvin like, Sapp. You can't sing that. I'm like, why not? It's feel-good music. Like, yeah. I still believe in God. Like, exactly. But I, and I feel like the messages of gospel music, because I don't go to church, because the physical church, there was so much going on in there, and I, and I wanted to know from her, like, what she thought about the church and tradition, how, you know, some of the conservative people in church have run a lot of the young people away. Mm -hmm. But one thing I will say is that gospel music, for many reasons in many ways, has been... Um, God to me you know yeah. like I feel like if I can go to a church or if I can turn on a, a record and there's music gospel music that's really really good and I feel that anointing I don't know it just changes my whole day when I'm depressed I suddenly find myself reaching for gospel music while I'm cleaning the house because it feels like something's washing over me because mm -hmm. those messages are universal like somebody out there mm -hmm. loves you you're someone's child everything has a purpose I need to hear that when I'm having a bad day well her song the battle is not yours it's the Lord's I told her in Atlanta, I said, well, sometimes the Lord, <laughs> sometimes I gotta tell him like, nah, this one's mine. Cause you know, I, I've always wondered how somebody like her has been so solid, 40 years in music and not had, Jesus. she hasn't had a Kim Burrell or a, what's that guy's name? Kirk Franklin moment? <laughs> or Donnie McClurkin. Right. The, but, the this, it, that he is. but isn't that a part of it? Like, you know, I, I did go to the church at one point in my life cause my mom's Christian, uh, my adopted mom. And I feel like you can't judge anyone, right? And I feel like, that's you shouldn't what, judge it. That's, but that's what I thought it was all about. It's supposed yeah. to be like you could always come back to God. So I'd be wondering like why people be so critical sometimes of some of the gospel singers when they, you know, fall from grace sometimes. Yeah. It's like, isn't that a part of the human journey? Condition, yeah. Yeah, like you're, gonna, you're not always going to be perfect in the eyes of the Lord, but you know. Yeah, you know, and part of uh, the interview, I asked her, you know, because it's Yolanda Adams, I don't want to go to hell asking Jesus' <laughs> disciple <laughs> questions, but I had to ask her because she was on Sunday's Best. What do you think about Kim Burrell being canceled? What do you think about Kirk Franklin and him getting caught cussing out his son? Um, and well, hey, look. <laughs> but because but, you know, she's on a new show uh, called Kingdom Business. It's executive produced oh, wow. by... Um, by Kirk Franklin and Devon Franklin. And I had to even ask her about the judgment that Megan Good got when she ended up hooking up with yeah. Devon. So I was really surprised at how candid she was. And I also didn't know that she actually had interest in doing what we do. She, she's done radio, but she yeah. loves journalism. As a woman, I can, can I also say, I love that she's not matronly and that she's a beautiful woman who gets glammed up and can look beautiful and still like work for the Lord. Because I feel like there, there was an error. I don't want to talk about the 90s too badly, where everybody looked <laughs> real rough and matronly. <laughs> and I was like, well, I think God wants oh, you to be my cute church, too. I remember the pastor standing up in my church and saying, if you wear makeup, if you wear lipstick, and I looked over, I'm like, Sister Ruth got on red lips. Sister Ruth. No, Sister Ruth, yeah. she used to have the skirts and the red lip. I'm like, Sister Ruth, he talking to you. Um, and I remember testimony service. That, that, I will say, one thing I do miss about going to church, testimony service. Because testimony service really was the tea. It really like, was. Like, you'd be like, first giving honor to God and the first lady. You know, I woke up this morning and came to church, even though some people didn't, you know, thank you for coming, brother. you are like, yo, you just threw him under the bus. So the real tea, where I caught all the tea, that was at church. That's actually really true. And some of our best singers came from church. Yeah. Look at Brandy. Like that voice, that instrument. Whitney. Whitney, child. Let's <laughs> talk about Whitney. Musicians in general, you know, yeah. like a lot of the people from 1500 and nothing, a lot of our, you know, people that we love that play all types of instruments started in the church. It was like... All them thugs yeah. from 1500 and nothing was at the church. I ain't going to say all of them, but a lot of them, because <laughs> think about it, you know, growing up, it's not always a rec center or a music school you can go to. Yeah. The church had the, the equipment and everything. That was like... The music school for the for the hood. And speaking of music, we cannot talk about church music without talking about the gays who kept the, the choir up. Okay. Well, we know most of them very too well. So I'm just saying, shout out to the LGBTQ plus I community that has held the church down, whether they acknowledge the you or not. From the, the choir. pool pit to the choir. <laughs> but listen, Yolanda Adams did not fail to uh, entertain in this interview because we were able to see all depths of her motherhood, ageism. Um, dating, um, and what she thinks about cancel culture. So take a look.
All right, every time I have a gospel singer or performer on the show, all y'all be in the comments saying you're trying to get closer to God. And I am, even in my private <laughs> time. But now I have a gospel legend, Yolanda Adams. You know, I walked up to you um, in Atlanta, and I was surprised that you knew who I was. I was because, um, I mean, I know I meet a lot of people, but I revere you so high. Um, there's been many low moments where your music has got me through. And I know, like many people, people are watching say, yeah, me too. So it was so... Um, validating for like the journey that I'm on to have a legend know who I am, but more importantly, to be able to give you your flowers in person. So I'm honored that you came to the studio today. Oh, come on. I love this space. This space is cool. I was geeking over how, you know, I, I need this in my life. No, <laughs> Listen, you're the only person that can use it rent free. You can oh, you are just you so sweet. Thank you so much. But I mean, listen, let's talk about pop culture and all of that. Uh, you are at the forefront of what is happening culturally. Thank you. So we know who you are. We Thank believe you. what you say. And when you sit down with people, you're able to pull out of them, you know, sometimes things that other folks can't. Thank you. And so that's a, that's a sign of a great journalist. Mm. And I know you're more than just a journalist, but you know, you know that was my major in uh, college, so. Oh, really? Yes. So, Wait, so you would have been out here doing all of this? Well, you've done radio. You've, I've done, you've radio, done radio, yes, and we're still we're we're building from radio to do television and all of that, and yeah. But what part of this business attracted you? Because I didn't grow up knowing I wanted to do journalism or talk. You know, I just love pop culture. I love black culture. I love celebrity culture. So I knew I wanted to be in it, but I didn't have no talents. I can't sing. I sung on my Instagram a Beyonce song yesterday, and all the comments were like, "Please go back to your day job." <laughs> But why, why, why did this attract you? Oh, it attracted me for several reasons. Uh, I'm a lover of people, and I loved how people navigate through trials and you know stuff that they go through. And I love big stories. I love things that make people think, because you know with journalism you have the opportunity to pull stuff out of people and then ask them the questions that other folks don't ask, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which is why I like what you do. Because, you know, every now and then you get a little basic, okay, so how did you feel about so-and-so? Yeah, and that and, and what do you expect us, what are we, sh what should we expect from this and this and that? Like, <sighs> Well, I, I feel like, because I'm a fan of the culture, I don't want to do an interview that I wouldn't watch. Right. You know, so if, if I know I have, first of all, I learned so much about you preparing for today that I didn't even know. Because oh, okay. when I see you, I see you, you're always a light, you're always giving back to people and, and filling them up. Like when we were in um, Atlanta for the BMI event. Yes. Or I think it was a BMI event with Catherine Bruton. It was, was with famous. Catherine Bruton. Yes. Mm -hmm. When you got up and gave your speech, your speech was really blessing everybody in the audience with the word oh. that they probably needed to hear. Good. So do you find yourself always being that person that wants to build other people up? Yeah. I got that. I grew up like that. I'm the oldest of six kids. So I grew up knowing that your words can change people's day. They can change people's lives. And so uh, trying to encourage my brothers and sisters to do better, be better, all of that kind of stuff. They didn't listen sometimes. No, y'all didn't. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but I think that role was innately in me as the oldest and having to uh, gather and garner the troops while mom and dad did what they had to do. Um, I, I just believe that there's so much power in kindness. Mm -hmm. And if we don't do that, who's gonna do it? But you don't ever have a bad day? Yes! But I mean, why don't we ever get to see it? Like, I wanna see Yolanda Adams in a road rage incident. Where, <laughs> now that you won't where see. Where you just have to read them to heaven, you know? No, yeah, nah, you, you won't see the road rage. <laughs> and you know, I, I'll get, you know, I'll go as far as to say, oh, that just pissed me off, you know, kinda <laughs> like that. <laughs> <laughs> but that's as far as you get with the cussing. So, you know, unless it's Danita, Danita but it, but Jordan. It, but is it, is it because, what gives you the restraint to not go all the way and lose it? Because is it your faith in God? Is it just your character? Is it just the energy you want to give out in life? Because I, I, I try. Um, <laughs> there are days I say, Lord, you know. I'm, you know I'm, me. I'm going to be a better. <laughs> yeah, you know me. You created me in your right. likeness, even right now. Um, but then there's days where I'm just like, I can't. Yeah, I think it's a combination of all of it. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the, the one thing I don't want ever is for somebody to get a snap of me, you know, 
you do, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And then it goes viral. And then all of my folks are like, well, we can't support her anymore. She said a cuss word, you know, right, right. that kind of thing. But like that happened with your friends with Kirk Franklin. That happened with him and his yes, son. Yes, it did happen. But why can't people, I look at like Kirk and all of his contributions in the, like to, to world music and faith mm -hmm. and all that and what he stands for. And he has a moment of what he thought was a private moment with his child. Right. When, when you see something like that, or even Kim Burrell and with yes. the church and the gay comments, mm -hmm. why are we as a people not as forgiving when it comes to our own? I think it's years and years and years of brainwashing and gaslighting and all of that kind of stuff. Because, I mean, you have to give people a break. If you want a break, give people a break. Mm -hmm. If you want forgiveness, give forgiveness. If you want kindness, give kindness. I've known Kirk and Carry On for years. And so that dynamic, they know each other mm -hmm. and they know what that means. It is unfair for me to step in there and say, well, you know, Kirk, that was horrible. And so, that, that's not my role. Right. My role is friend. My role is sister for carry on, it's auntie, you know, and uh, unfortunately, because of the world we live in now, people will take those private moments and abuse them and use them for their own advantage. Unfortunately, they don't want you to see their scars and their skeletons and all of that stuff. So, I mean, when I saw it, I immediately, um, wanted to make sure that they both were okay. Mm. Because you, you know, we, we, we're in this uh, social space now, people can blow up something that was intended, like you said, for a private moment between Kirk, uh, Carry On, and uh, the mother, because now you got this triangle going, then you got this family thing going, and then everybody wants to pick sides. Why are we picking sides? How come we just can't pick truth? But see, you said something that I think, and I, I struggle with, because um, I just interviewed uh, Patrice Cullors, the co-founder of the Black Lives Matter movement. I really feel like she's in the middle of a mainstream witch hunt lynching, mm -hmm. where they're trying to build a narrative that's not necessarily true. And we bought on, into it. Black people, we bought into it. And I feel like when it comes to the carry-ons and the Kirks or mm -hmm. a Kimberell and you know somebody who's gay and who who didn't like the comments I also still play her music and I love what she does for gospel music and there that was a moment remember that was a moment of frustration mm -hmm. that she had just getting off a plane mm -hmm. somebody said something snappy to mm -hmm. her and you know again that was somebody in her congregation who happened to be taping that day mm -hmm. and taped that whole thing. So, you know, again, love Kim with all my heart, but I don't want anybody to prejudge her or judge her on a 15 minute blurb or a five minute blurb and forget the legendary um, talent that she actually is. Yeah, and I say we're not the sum of one mistake. No. You know, or, or a sum of one idea. And that's why I think like, I've seen moments where our people, I think, have just gone a little too far. And this is Jason's thought saying, you know, I just feel like we're not as forgiving. And when you said, you know, we want compassion, we want love, we want all these things, but it's easy to forget all that when it doesn't apply to us. Like it's easier to apply judgment and whatever on other people. But it shouldn't be mm -hmm. that easy. Mm -hmm. I agree. Because I, I'm very thoughtful in the way I speak and what I say and how I uh, use my words. And I've been like that all my life. Mm -hmm. uh, my sister and I were talking the other day and she's like, you know what, you always said that you were <laughs> a billionaire. I said, I jumped from millionaire to a billionaire just by saying the words, mm -hmm. you know, as a teenager. And she's like, you've, al and you've always spoken what you wanted and you got it. I'm like, you know what, I didn't even think about that, yeah. So are you, are you a manifester? Definitely. Really? Yes. But is it manifesting, like consciously manifesting, or do you say it and it just somehow happens? Because I'm finding myself in this space where I always say, well, now nah, it's really God. Like as much as I may look like a heathen on camera, uh, <laughs> behind the scenes, I do pray and I'm, I pray and, I'm, and I thank God even when no, nothing good is happening. Mm -hmm. And even when bad things are happening, I'm like, you know, there's a lesson in this somewhere. Yes. And, and recently I did an interview, I think with Complex, and I was saying to them that, um, you know, when my brother died, it really was a moment for me to say, this is literally the lowest moment of my life. Mm -hmm. So everything that comes after, I'm, I'm already going to be able to get through it. You exactly. know? And it's just helped me. So I know that I'm consciously manifesting, but 
do you do you consciously map out every step to get to the manifestation or do you feel like what you think and what you feel and where it's coming from is a place that's going to lead you to it well it all starts with habit if you are consciously aware that again that your words matter and words have power and they can adversely or positively affect your life as you grow, I mean, I'm 60 years old. Come on now. Okay, so I didn't know you were 60 years old. We're going to get to that. <laughs> because the way I do my notes, you put the birthday and age at the top, and I'm not going to lie, I am surprised because I don't want to get too far. We're going to no, get no, 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 no. But what I was saying that the, you know, Because ain't nobody the watching this right now walk... believing no 60. Not... And you know she don't lie, so. No, I don't. So the more you walk through your life and walk through this, because it's a journey, it's not a sprint, it's not, you know, a, a hundred yard dash. This is literally a journey of life. It's it's a marathon, if, if you want to, mm -hmm. you know, use that uh, track term. And the more you speak kindly to yourself and the more you speak the things that you know are in your heart, they have to be in your heart first mm -hmm. for them to be genuine. And so I'm not speaking, you know, oh, I want to be a, um, a horse owner and I want my horse to win the Preakness. I'm, I'm, I'm not concerned about horses. I love horses. <laughs> I, I'm an animal lover, but I'm not going to buy a billion dollar horse and then race them all, you know, all that. kind. So my manifestations are never that. I'm always concerned about my environment, how I, um, how I nurture my daughter, because I was very uh, clear when, when I was carrying her that I'm not going to raise her. Mm -hmm. I'm going to nurture her, because when you nurture, you're building. And as you build, the, the young mind, which is your child, grows into this amazing adult that you can be proud of. So what's the difference between nurturing and raising? Raising to me is, and I just, I, I don't like the word raise because we raise animals, mm -hmm. you know, and nurture means you educate, you encourage, you inspire, you uh, lift up, you know, the, in raising, you don't really do that. You know, you make sure they have something to eat. You make sure they have somewhere to live. <laughs> they just stay alive. <laughs> they just stay alive. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so to me, that's the difference between raising and nurturing. So part of the speech you gave in Atlanta, um, you really, t your daughter presented you with the award. And then you talked a lot about her and how important that was and how it made you feel with her being there and being as a student she is and all of that. Um, was w The pride came in knowing that you were a good nurturer. And knowing that all of the lessons that she was a part of have really kind of manifested in her life mm -hmm. because she's a manifester as well. Mm -hmm. Prime example, um, she was in middle school and she was looking at different uh, schools to go to for high school. And she went on a, um, on a visit to one school and she's like, mom, I think I wanna go to this school. I'm like, okay, well, you know what to do. So she went, she bought two sweatshirts and two t-shirts. And for two months between the time she had the visit and the time they got their letters, every day she wore either the sweatshirt with her uh, skirt, you know, her uniform, or the t-shirt with her uniform. And she got her letter two months later, hey, welcome to so-and-so and so-and-so. And she's like, I, I did it, I did it, I did it. I'm like, hey, you did that on your own. Mm -hmm. All I did was prepare you. You know, every step of your life, I showed you how to do what I did. Mm -hmm. I showed you how to do what mom taught me, what grandma taught me, what dad taught me, what grandfather taught me. And so I'm a part of this huge lineage of, uh, you know, being careful of what you speak but making sure that if you say something, you create it. Mm. So now you're, you're married now, right? Uh, no. <laughs> you're not married now. Wait, so, wait, so you, your first husband, though, wasn't her father. No, 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 and no, no, that, no, no. That no. was an abusive relationship. I didn't that even know you were abusive. in an abusive relationship. I, yeah, well, like, like, I'm extremely you, private. And the thing is, I didn't want my experience with him to 
spill over. To spill over into, you know, because I'm this, I'm this presence. And I didn't want that to spill over into his next marriage or his next relationship or whatever. But why were you thinking about him when the abuse wasn't thinking about you? Like it wasn't in your best interest to protect him, but right? Well, it was in my best interest not to talk about it mm. because I'm not going to talk about the negative thing that happened to me over and over and over and again, because the more you rehearse something, the more it stays in your life. Mm. The more you look at a thing and say, okay, this was a negative thing in my life. I've learned from this. This ain't happening no more. Mm -hmm. You know, I wrote about that in my book, chapter five. I'm not going to say the title because you're here and I really feel guilty. Speaking <laughs> it's quite all right. That way, but if you ever get, <laughs> I get you my book, chapter five. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> but it's so, but it's crazy because you're su such a strong force. Mm -hmm. And I, the reason why I brought that up, not to, to go into that, but in terms of preparing your daughter or nurturing your daughter on what a healthy relationship looks like. Mm -hmm. Do you have those conversations? Oh, she's, we have to have those conversations. Now, right? She's an adult, 21 right. years old. She's grown. She's real grown. And she's pretty and she's out here. Yes. So how do you prepare her for avoiding getting into a situation like that or, or being aware of, uh, a situation that she may need to get out of. Well, that's the only thing you can do. You can give her the information, you can lead by example, but it's still her choice. Mm -hmm. Like I said, I've nurtured her to understand what healthy relationships are and what healthy relationships are not by leading by example. Mm -hmm. And she's had two little relationships. I'm, I don't want to call them, I'm sorry, Taylor, I don't want to call them little, but, uh, <laughs> and so she, she knew how to navigate that. You know, she's old enough to know better and young enough to still look at her life and say, hmm, okay, I learned from that. That's not happening anymore. You're not married now. How does a man who's watching right now, do, can they slide in your DMs? Nope. Like, you're not, you're not a nope. slider. Okay. So how does a man walk, because no, you're I'm very not, intimidating. I'm not gonna say I'm not a slider, but I'm not a DM slider. Not a DM slider. Right. Okay, so like how does a man approach a woman who's like one text away from God? Like how do you, <laughs> what do you say? <laughs> you know, because like when I talk uh, to you or Karen Clark or you know, um, even when Marvin Sapp was on the show, like I, I have Karen's number, but I'm afraid, like I don't even bother you all. Right. I, okay, I have to tell you a funny story. <laughs> We're sitting at my house one day and something came over me. I said, let me text Yolanda. So I text her. No response. No, I called you. Yes. No response. I called her again. No response. Then I called her again and she texts me. She says, I'm in church. I'll call you back. I don't know why I called you in the morning on Sunday. <laughs> on Sunday. Of all people. <laughs> and my friend next to me said, she probably in church. Right. And when you text back, you're in church. I was like, yo, look at how the devil would try to get in between you and your God. <laughs> but how does a man approach you? Like, what do they say? Or how can they approach you? Um, I mean, just, just approach, be authentic, be real. I'm too old for games, <laughs> you know, uh, and, and you, you know, you, you just can't, you know, come any kind of way. I mean, just like anybody else would. Would you date a rapper? First of all, if he <laughs> is a 50 year old rapper or a 60 year old rapper, <laughs> that's all I'm going to say. I love rap and y'all know I do, but. Wait, so you did Jesus Walk. I talked to you. Yes, with talked, Kanye, yes. I talked to you in Atlanta, um, and he, you know, he was telling me privately how much he loved you, and then mm -hmm. privately you were telling me how much you loved him. When you did that song, did you get criticism? From I everybody? always get criticism. Because really? I feel like you're so progressive, and you get how to bring the younger people and right. church together. And people are so, some people are just so traditional that they just don't understand it. When you did that song, I mean, you had us. We, we everywhere. We in the club singing the songs. You exactly. Is, exactly. Was that intentional? Of course. It, it, here's the thing. When someone approaches me with an idea or a duet or an appearance on a song, uh, I did something with bone, but Bones Thug. <laughs> bone Thugs and Harmony. Bone Thugs and Harmony. <laughs> yes, I did something with them. And um, it was, you know, it was Order My Steps. And they redid that. And my thing is, if someone, I mean, because everybody knows me and they know who I am and they know what I represent. And for somebody to have the courage to, you know, say, hey, uh, we want you over here. Mm -hmm. I'm like, of course, you know, there, w there was no cussing. There was no fussing. There was none of that. I mean, all of them were just gentlemen. Mm -hmm. So we can try to say that there's a separation in our culture from God and who we are. God to us is just like breathing mm -hmm. 
and he should be, or she should be, or it should be, because God is spirit, you know, and those that worship him worship in spirit and in truth. So there's no gender there. But I don't believe, and this is just my personal belief, I don't believe that anybody gets here without having the stamp of approval for purpose from God. Mm -hmm. We all have a purpose. Now, if we live it out, it's awesome. If we're trying to find our way, that's awesome as well because you discover all of the beauty that is you that came from, from God. Mm -hmm. And so I, I don't see a difference in singing a song with a Marvin Sapp who I love and right, I've Marvin, known him yeah. forever and a major because major is from uh, Texas mm -hmm. and I love him as well. He chose his path, that's his purpose, that's his power. And I'm not gonna look at him and say, you know what, you sang that nice little wedding song, but uh, no, that's never been me. And so I've always had criticism. I've been criticized by uh, folks because my dresses were too tight or my dresses were too short back in the day. Uh, I had always, so much makeup I and always this and feel that. it's the people that can't fit in the dresses that are mad. <laughs> and I always say to somebody like, why are you so consumed with what another person looks like? Because if the voice of God is coming out of you in a tighter dress or a long gown or whatever, because that was part of the struggles Megan Good was having when she got married to Devon Franklin. As soon as she got married or engaged or started dating, the world tried to tear her apart because of how she looked on the red carpet with him. But I'm like, yo, you could still be a good woman and look good and dress how it, I mean, I, I, didn't, I didn't understand where the, all the judgment First of from. all, it's time out for all of that. Yeah. Uh, because folks are gonna come not looking like what you're used to with the power of God in them. Mm -hmm. I still believe that every person that gets to this earth has the power of God in them. You cannot separate your blood from you know who you are. If you, if you stop, if you stop, if the blood stops going to your heart, you die. Right. So if that spirit stops going to your soul, you, I mean, you're, you're a sad person. Mm. So, I don't know. So how was working with Kanye? I love Kanye. Mm -hmm. You know I do, I told you that. You I did. think I he, told him you said that yeah, too. I think he has genuine uh, ideas of bringing people together. And I think he has been unfairly judged because of moments mm -hmm. and because he's such a public person, I think his private moments that have become public uh, have not served him well. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that he's not a good person. Mm -hmm. And so I love the person I know, mm -hmm. you know. I was, uh, when we were in the car, <clears throat> I don't know if I shared this, but we were in the car and um, he was going through his music and he got to the gospel album and he was playing, you brought the sunshine. And so I, I started uh, calling Karen behind him. We get out the car and I said, hey, his phone. And I hand it to him and he's like, no, no. Like he's nervous yeah. to talk to her and he gets on the phone, they're talking. And then um, he put her on speakerphone and she asked everybody about their heads. So she prayed for him. Good. But it was a moment where I saw like how much he needed it, how mm -hmm. much he appreciated it. Mm -hmm. And I know how much he appreciates you and how much he loves her. But also just in looking at the gospel albums, were you surprised at the success of his gospel music? Not at all. I think because some people were. Why? I don't know. It's in him. Right. You know, and, and but why I, can't people see the duality, right? Well, why I, people, don't, I don't know. I'm not worried about why they can't see mm. it. That's them. They're going to have to answer for that. He... He tells folks all the time that he grew up listening to that. He grew up in it. You know, he went to church. It, that, that's not, and, and again, in our culture, it's not foreign for us to love God and be in different parts of the entertainment business. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't make that same judgment on um, sports figures. And they say the same thing. You know, I want to thank God for a great night, you know, or, you know, however they describe their, you know, three-point shooting and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but I, do, I don't see a problem with the gospel album that he did. My thing is the people who are making the judgment calls, have you even listened to it? Mm -hmm. Because Fred is on it. 
you know, um, Mary Mary and them, uh, Warren Campbell and all of these folks that we love and adore who do own, you know, who do gospel music, they're on there. So you didn't really listen to it. You just want to criticize. So not wondering why they do that, let me ask you this question, because even in interview, and I'll go back to Patrice Colors, a lot of people in the comments were saying, not even watching it and said all their judgment. Yeah. How do we get people to indulge, listen, uh, evaluate, have more free thinking, so that way we can embrace the totality of an experience instead of judging it based on an uh, idea or an image? Well, first of all, the people who will get it will get it. And we cannot spend all of our energy and our time Investing trying to, no, trying to convince people. Because at this part, part, point in my life, at this age, I'm not trying to convince nobody of nothing. Mm -hmm. I am who I am. <laughs> and this is me. You've seen me, you know, in uh, what? This is 40 years of music. So it's like you either with me or you're like, Hey, on the other side of the street. Okay, know? so the queen of contemporary gospel, 60 years old. I saw that on the sheet. I, I had no clue um, because, you know, you look a lot younger than a lot of these folks. Uh, thank now, you. <laughs> I was talking recently at dinner with Madonna, who's 63, yes. about ageism. Mm -hmm. how, are, how When you think about aging, even though you don't look it on the outside, mm -hmm. lots full of life, what, do you, what does aging mean to you? Aging to me is, I mean, it's a natural progression. Mm -hmm. We get, as, as soon as we get here, we're aging, mm -hmm. you know, because we're gonna do that for the rest of our lives. And I don't believe that there should be this stigma that after a certain age, you need to sit in the corner and be quiet. There's all this wisdom that I've gained over these years that I wanna share with people, you know, whether that's a podcast, whether that's talking to you one-on-one. Mm -hmm. -on -one. Um, that they may not know and they may not get this information from anybody else because they may not be honest enough with them to let them know that there will be days when you are so high that it's like, oh, I can do any and everything that I want to do. I can accomplish this. I can, you know, shoot to the moon. And then there, there will be those days, like you expressed earlier, where grief, loss, all of these things happen to you. It doesn't mean that your life is over. It just means that you have to pivot and shift, understand the moment, you know, grieve if you have to, cry if you have to, uh, but know that this is not the end. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people want after, you know, 50 years old to say, oh, my life is ended. Child, <laughs> let me tell you how it's only getting started. <laughs> so, where, so that um, thought come from, because I could tell you there's some 25 year olds I know that are like, oh, my God. Yeah. And I'm like, you ain't even live long enough to talk about, oh, my God. Right. So so how do you keep that that positive thought? And then secondly, how do you look so good? Well, uh, like what are your what are your. What the, are your tricks? Oh, oh, there are no tricks. It's just only uh, real time stuff. First of all, uh, you you have to talk to yourself. And I know people won't. You know that sounds a little weird, but you have to talk to yourself because. You, Sometimes you will say, you know, I don't feel like getting up this morning. I don't feel like getting up this afternoon. I don't feel like getting up, mm -hmm. you know, and then you have to like, uh, wait a minute now. If I have breath in my body, if I'm blessed to have activity of all my limbs and they're working just fine, why wouldn't I get up? Right. Just do it for yourself. There are times when I just wake up and I get ready for the day because I, I start my day off definitely when I wake up. I am in a whole hour of gratitude. Mm. Every day. Every single day. Seven days a week. Every single day. Let me tell you why. For the why. whole first hour? For the whole first hour. Because, okay, we know that spirituality is about relationship with God. You don't want to start off any relationship. Well, you know, my back was hurting and so on, so on, so on. If that was a human, that person would be like, you know what? Uh, if I got to hear about that one more day. <laughs> so I just think that God has such a great sense of humor. So I start off with a, an hour of gratitude. And then after that, I go to Pilates. Every and, day? Well, every day that I can. Oh, really? Okay. Because if I am not in Houston at my studio, 
what I do is uh, I'll work out either at the hotel or in my hotel room. I have little gadgets and stuff mm -hmm. that my trainer gives me. And, and I just do that because it makes me feel good. Mm -hmm. uh, I am able to run miles because I take care of my body. I don't eat a lot of crazy stuff. I don't drink a lot of crazy stuff. Um, I am not a, are you, a real dairy. Are you a drink dairy. a gallon of water a day person though? <sighs> Because people are, I, I don't, I, sometimes I feel like I'm drowning in water. They're like, drink another gallon. I don't, can't, I don't even have it in me. Well, and I am not a proponent that everybody needs to drink a gallon of water. If you drink a half a gallon of water and you're consuming watermelon, cantaloupe, things like that that already contain water, I think your body uses those fruits and veggies even more than just the gallon of water. Mm -hmm. So I just think if you live your life in balance, because I'm very balanced, if you live your life in balance, it comes back with so many rewards. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and so the other things, no tricks though. The other things that I do- I have I a do, trick, it's a dermatologist. He's, no, 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 that's not a trick. It's not? No, no, well, no, no, no. Well, some gadgets you and some gotta, stuff we're doing that's oh, kind of tricky. Well, well, here's the thing. <laughs> if I, I love the microcurrents. Yes, I do Because that. it keeps, you know, it keeps your skin plumped and your muscles all whatever. And I am not a full pro pro proponent of stuff that, you know, like fillers because mm -hmm. that stuff you know, with gravity and all of that, it goes away and goes into different places. And I don't want my, you know, I don't want another eyeball here. Or I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Nothing against y'all that like that. No, look, you know? I have to tell you. So I got fillers. I did. But but see, you don't look like you have no, fillers. No, I know. I have a Derm King. The Derm King out here, he does Angela. He does a lot of people, you know, because I was doing the show and people, the fans were saying, boy, Jason looks tired. I was like, they said I was tired on the day I had rested. But, I, but, you know, it was more about, like, me wanting to, you know, feel fresh and just, yes. you know. And if you do it for you, yeah, that's fine. But, but not, don't do it for somebody else. Yeah, because I'll and, get caught up in that. And then yes. the next time you come, my, my eye will be here. No, I won't, I won't like no, that. Well, don't no, let that happen. We won't like that. Okay, so uh, I want to go back to nurturing. So mm -hmm. on Sunday's Best, uh, my favorite season was Leandra Johnson. Yes. And you were a judge. Yes. And... Did you know the minute she walked in and saying that she had the anointing? Because I kind of feel like like Warren Campbell and Erica's church is at a school. When mm -hmm. you walk in, there, it's at a school, but the anointing is there. I can right. go there and feel it, but I can mm -hmm. go to a church and not feel it. Yes. When she came in, did you know she had something special? Well, in the interview portion, I was out of the country. Me and my team were out of the country uh, doing a festival. And I came in when the actual taping started. Mm -hmm. And I think, who was there in my place? I think Kim may have been mm -hmm. in my place uh, because I was gonna be out for two weeks. And then when I finally saw her, it was like, oh yeah, oh yeah, <laughs> oh yeah. Because you can't listen to her and not hear that, God, that she's been with God. Mm -hmm. And even in whatever she's dealt with in her life, mm -hmm that even validates it more that she's still here and she still wants to sing that, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. It was good to see her story and see her win. And it's almost like you've been this guardian angel because there, and then I remember when she sung uh, Warren, uh, Marvin Sapp's song, you were standing mm -hmm. off to the stage. I was offside. When she was singing. It was one of those things, you know, we have a tendency to run. She was going on and on and then you were up next and she looked over and she was like, it's time to go. But even in the re-release of that song, she owned it. Yes. And she did a phenomenal job. Yes, she did. And what people didn't see uh, from the camera side is that I was back there saying, sing Leandria, <laughs> sing Leandria. I just think that when you give people room enough to grow, they grow. I didn't get to the place that I am right now at 25. Mm -hmm. No one gets to this place without experience. Mm -hmm. And so the things that I've experienced in my life give me the compassion. Mm -hmm. They give me the forgiveness. They give me the tact to deal with people and see people who have said something derogatory or negative about me and not have to, Nobody you know. said nothing derogatory. Oh, child, about. yes, they do. No, they child, why she got that on? That's too close <laughs> to her skin it, color. That, that's Look. church people, though? That's not <laughs> No, like... it, could be, it could be anyone. You know, and I don't want to just say church people because... We can't just put all people 
in the church people box, mm -hmm. you know, because you have people who love God, who are not churchy people. And then you have church people who do it because of tradition. Mm -hmm. And if anything COVID taught us is that you have to have a relationship with God at your own house by yourself, mm -hmm. especially and, when and there's catch, a quarantine going on. And if you catch on. COVID and you ain't right, you better get right because he can call you home <laughs> at any moment. Ah, you are no, funny. Th that's what COVID, oh my God. No, COVID taught me, COVID taught me, you better get you it better. together because you could be walking around here 14 days later, all that judgment you had, now you at the gate locked out. You know what's interesting, because I used to, so in my book, I talk about, um, you know, being taken out of the home, going to foster care and all that. One yeah. of my foster parents were, were, was a pastor and a first lady, mm -hmm. uh, Pentecostal. I mean, it was people, people falling out. And, and now, even to this day, I can't even go to a church if that spirit's if not that in is, there. Uh -huh. But the churchy people or the church people ran me away from the church because I yes. looked at the church. You know, I didn't, I couldn't separate. Because you couldn't separate it. Yeah. And, and remember that was early in your development mm -hmm. of knowing what God really was like and what God really is like mm -hmm. and what God is to you. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, a lot of people, I mean, a lot of gospel artists weren't raised the way I was. Mm -hmm. God has always been a cool element of our lives. Mm -hmm. God went to the skating rink with us. God went to the grocery <laughs> store with us. God went to the volleyball games with us. You know, God was just a cool part of my life growing up. So I didn't have the restrictions of you can't wear this. You can't do this. You can't look like that. You can't look like this. God was so cool. He went to modeling school with me, you know. <laughs> so that's how I see God. And that's why I am so uh, compassionate to people who feel that they have to do something extra for God to love them. You don't have to do anything but exist mm -hmm. and God will love you. Because again, if you got to this earth, God loves you. Now is going to church an important part of the process of having a relationship with God? So for young people watching, or even myself, mm -hmm. like Warren Campbell and again, his wife, I would go to their church because I feel good when I'm in there. I, I, I when they're talking or even the music and music really is, I think what keeps me connected. Like uh -huh. some people, when, when they're singing, I, I don't know if this is right, but I just feel like there's ministers of music. When they sing, mm -hmm. they're ministering to the heart just like it's somebody at the pulpit preaching. Yes. And so they have a good music program, of course, but then they have um, just the word is really good. Mm -hmm. How do we get young people who may not feel in, important to go to church or important to have a church relationship feel that it is important? Well, I think you start with an Eric, Erica and uh, Warren, mm -hmm. you know, people that they view as, you know, great people having great environments that they can be themselves in. You know, you can't take a kid who has listened to, uh, you know, rap and all of that kind of stuff and then put them in a church where only hymns are being sung. <laughs> because that's not going to work for them. You know, they don't understand that. Okay, so now I need a book and I need to know how to read notes and <laughs> all of that. So you find places, and this is what I tell anyone searching for a church home, find the place that fits you best because that, that way you can thrive. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I have been at my church now for almost mm, like 30 years. Mm. And it's because my pastor and first lady never required me to sing. They never required See, me. See, I would have put that in the business plan, though. The, I mean, you're oh, there. Hilarious. <laughs> no. <laughs> but, but when I'm there, remember, I need to be fed yeah. because I've been all over the world trying to feed people. Mm. So that's the reason that I've been at Abundant Life forever. Mm. And so that was a good fit for us. Mm. And, you know, I've visited different places, but there's no place like home. Dorothy. No. <laughs> you know, one of my favorite performances you did, too, one of the NAACP Awards. Yes. Was, I've watched that so many times. Um, and the audience reaction and everybody falling out. And then um, the performance with Common at the White House. Oh, that was. That one right there. You know, I that, that night was really different. It was like every performance just kept building and building yeah. and building. Yeah. And to see it unfold in front of us, because, you know, you, you, you have two days of rehearsals, you have two days of blocking, you have all of that stuff that you have to do. And then all of a sudden, there's something that happens when the entire um, audience is there. 
and but you that don't really was think too. that audience was very different because you have you know you have fans you have folks who are like uh, okay yeah but but most of the people in there are from the industry <laughs> right right and to see their reaction of that particular performance and you know that was the first time that i had done that with common yeah, he was on the because show he him. and uh john had won the oscar yeah. for that yeah uh, a couple of months before mm -hmm. and uh he he asked he said uh auntie kim will you sing this with me i'm like anything you ask me to do you know i'm doing yeah and it it turned out so well that um he's like okay you need to re-record that yeah did, did you do it no, nah, we haven't oh, yet. Oh, that was so good. Yeah. And just with Michelle and Barack there and with yeah. all those, I mean, the room was just, that was special. Yeah. That was really good. So so now BET plus the uh, Kingdom business. Yes. Let's talk about that. Yes. So that's a new show that's premiering. Is the premiere tonight? The premiere is tonight. So tell folks about it. Okay. Well, I am uh, Miss Danita Jordan, <laughs> who is... First lady, businesswoman, mother, uh, philanthropist, all of these things. And I am having to come to terms with the fact that I might not be number one anymore. And so not only that, I'm also coming to terms with this uh, financial issue that is not only affecting me and my family, but it's affecting everyone in my employee. So that's another issue. And then of course, um, you know, my husband and the church and my husband and this and my kids and that, and, you know. And so we wanted to concentrate mostly on the business, which is why it's called kingdom business mm -hmm. instead of churchy business. Mm -hmm. um, and how you have to navigate the music business in the kingdom, just like you do any business. It's a business. Mm -hmm. People are looking at the bottom line. You have uh, folks who are putting their monies in to make sure that this artist is doing well and that artist is doing well. You know, you have your shareholders that you're, you have to deal with. So, I mean, people are going to be very, very surprised. In the beginning, it looks like I'm the ice queen as opposed to the queen of gospel. <laughs> So, so in the show, you're being, you're not being mean. You're being cold. Cold. <laughs> but they're saying it's a story of redemption. How? It is a story of redemption because there are several characters that are developing that are not your typical Sunday morning people. And, uh, and it's not just the obvious. You know, it's not just the exotic dancer. Everyone in the show has their own struggle with something. And so what we wanted to show is that no matter who you are, whether you're at the top of the food chain, the bottom of the food chain, God can still redeem you. Mm -hmm. So Soraya and Michael J. White, two people who've both been here on the show, they're yes. in it. What, are, what roles are they playing? Uh, Soraya is playing the exotic dancer. <laughs> And See, Sarai, first of all, Sarai I just love her. her. I love her too. I just love her. She is such a doll. Anyway, she is playing the exotic dancer and there is more of a connection between her and myself than I realize in the beginning. Mm. Uh, because I'm just, you know, straight up daughter of the church and all that kind of stuff. And I'm my daddy's daughter. Mm -hmm. I am my daddy's daughter. <laughs> and then Michael J. White, Michael J. White is like my nemesis. He's kind of like, you know, he, he was the love of my life. Mm. That's all I can say. And, uh, but now he's determined to be my enemy. And <laughs> I ain't playing with him. I'm, no. But he's, Michael J. White is pretty big. And, um, well, he's also a kung fu fanatic. Did, did you know that? Since he was a kid. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I always see him on Facebook. He always posts like the next karate kid. He would be the only black karate kid if one existed. When he was when he was younger, I saw a film on him. He had to be about 13. And he was I mean, he was doing he was doing the directing and the filming thing before anybody knew who he was as an actor. Mm. He was saying, OK, now catch me on my side and catch it. That's why he's such a great director. Catch me on this side and I'm going to swing my foot around. And this kid was I mean, he was a kid kid. And I'm like, 
This is absolutely phenomenal. You've got to release this. So this release is May 19th, which is today? Today. Uh, on BET Plus. On BET Plus. And so with BET Plus, can you stream and watch the whole season or is it episode at a time? Uh, you should watch it one episode at a time, but uh, there are eight episodes that we are very proud of that, you know, maybe this weekend you can binge mm. or however you want to watch it, just watch it. Watch it. Yeah. Well, listen, I um, am beyond honored that you came uh, to the show. See, people, um, gospel community, they love me. We do. Yeah. We love and Jason. And she followed Hollywood Unlocked. I was surprised that you were following us. You know, so he now He has the best story. We have a much more um, God-friendly uh, <laughs> content program. <laughs> no, but thank you so much. I appreciate you. Appreciate you, too. And thank you for what you do. Thank you. Yeah. I'm going to keep on doing it. You have to. <laughs> All right, I'm going to come to your church, too, by the way. Okay, please. Okay, on the weekend that you're singing. Okay. All right, check it out. <laughs> Peace. Ha, 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 ha.